have seen our garage tour of the world's quickest and fastest 200 mile an hour turbo Honda street tire bike. Now we're gonna see it in action and we're gonna break down some film, settle in, let's go. It's always fun to come to this garage and see this mean, high horsepower, turbocharged Honda. As I said, the world's fastest Honda. Frankie Stotts, he is number five on the GOAT list. Greatest of all time, 646 and potentially moving up. This thing's wild. All right, big thanks to all of you, the 100,000 plus that watched our first video, our garage tour. I am here with the Pro Street legend, my man, the five-time champion, Kent Stotts, always great to see you. Um, first off, the amount of people that watched your first video, you gotta be humbled by that. How many I, people I was, are interested? very much so. And, and Frank, I'm not the internet guy. Frank kept telling me, Dad, this, this thing's really moving. So that was pretty cool. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. People like this turbo Honda, it's fun to watch. Well, we got a real treat because we're gonna see it in action. What I plan to do is put out a video from Valdosta I'm gonna do that, but I figured it would be even better with your expertise and reaction. You can right. explain some of the things that we see. Yeah, it was the first time out for the bike all year. We had just, we had torn the bike down over the pre-COVID winter and to get it ready for the new rules, everything was brand new, powder coated, uh, and never got it out until the world finals. Let's check it out. Pro Street Drag Racing fans, remember the garage tour we did? They got 100,000 views of the world's fastest Honda. Now it's time to see it in action with some amazing street tire pro street bikes. Come on, let's go. Yes, Cycle Drag Universe, welcome back to South Georgia Motorsports Park. It is the Man Cup Finals. We were here before, before COVID hit. Now it's been a strange topsy-turvy 2020 year, but we're finishing in style. So many of you have asked about Frankie Stotts' Honda. Just two short years ago, he set the record here at a 660. Well, now the class advancing so quickly, they're knocking on the door of 620s. It's a tricky racetrack. It's a tough field. Let's see what Frankie can do against the rest of these gentlemen. So one thing I gotta ask you about right away, I talked about how quickly the class is advancing. You guys set the record just two years ago and now we're making leaps and bounds. What can you say about that? I well, mean, like you said, we set the record at 660 and uh, then the next year we came out, we were the first ones in the 650s. Everybody was trying to get there. There was a big mark there. Uh, but then shortly after that, we, uh, I think on the very next race, uh, we come out and Jeremy Teasley goes to 49, so we all have to try and step it up. And by the end of that race, we went to 646, which was stellar, but Jeremy went to 642 and we lost in the final with a 646. How do you lose when the record was just a 660 two races ago? We have that run. Let's, let's show you that one again, because that's one of the most astounding runs we've ever seen. <laughs> That's a run that you will never forget. To run a career best and lose, that's that's still a tough one. Well, we're going to head to Valdosta now for Maryland International Raceway. What's your impression of this event and this track? Um, Valdosta's always been good to us. Uh, the difference in Valdosta and the Jason Miller prep tracks is when you get to Jason Miller's track, truly, even on Thursday, you can, whatever you got in it, throw it at it, the track will handle it. Valdosta is a little more... Uh, it takes a day or two for it to come around. So Friday, you're still not able to run record numbers, but by Saturday morning, you can. Let's go to South Georgia Motorsports Park. Uh, 
Predictions here, Frankie. Uh, just trying to go straight. We got a new transmission, a new motor in the bike, so we're gonna turn the boost down from 56. Should run a 670. Hopefully. Good luck. All right, so the good news for you is at this point in the weekend, you had already been a 667. The bad news is Frankie's talking about changing transmissions already. Again. Oh my, tell me we, what was going on. We had on. a little issue. Um, we we're actually hurting third gear. Um, and we don't know why yet, but uh, it could be, you know, if I, if I put a bushing in wrong, it'll catch third and fourth gear next to it. We don't see that as we tear the trans out. The nice thing about the Hondas is the trans comes right out the side. We don't have to split, you know, pull the motor and split the cases. So we can dissect the problem. Um, but now well, we're going to see what it does here. Like, um, I think Frankie, we thought we'd go a 660 or a 670 and we went a 667 and that was not even shifting, in it, shifting into high gear. So we're, we're optimistic. Let's see how he can do against the turbo Hayabusa. Where you at Hayabusa fans or Honda fans, let us know which one you prefer. Rudy, of all places to run to your crew, I see him at the gas station this morning. They were very excited. They said, we figured some things out. Yeah, Is that true? Yeah, we had a bent pivot, which made the bike go left and right. Couldn't figure it out in 22 runs. We finally get it to go straight, and the air pressure regulator wouldn't let it make boost last night. So I'll put a new air pressure regulator on it, and we're going to go see what it does. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Bones. We're representing for the big men over here. If you could, what's it like to pilot this wild animal? A lot of fun, buddy. You like your chances here this weekend? Sure do. Good luck to you. Thank you. It should be interesting. Conditions are great, and we've heard some of the slick-tired motorcycles talk about track prep not being ideal. Well, the track prep is ideal for these guys because, remember, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a giant slick, they're dealing with a street tire. Track prep. Got to ask you about that. That was a hot topic down in Valdosta because yeah. the wheelie bar bikes, the slick bikes, especially the turbo ones, had some scary incidents. A lot of the pros were calling it over prep. For your class, you guys love that, right? Well, for, you know, I came from Funny Bike 25 years ago, so I know exactly what the slick and bar bikes, they have to do what's called getting up on the tire. The tire needs to grow, and then the bike stabilizes, and they get the best footprint, and they go down the track. They need about six to eight percent or ten percent tire slip for it to grow like that. A radial tire, like on our bikes or the drag radial classes today, don't want that. They that's not how their chassis and their tires work. So it's it's been a uh, ongoing. I won't. I won't. It's not a conflict. It's just one class works better with. Uh, a little bit of slip, and our class works better. If we could hook it gear to gear, that would be ideal. And sometimes the track prep is almost like that, to where it's very unlikely that you would spin. Can you ever have too much glue for your small tires? You can I used to there? say there's no such thing as too much horsepower or too much traction. Give me a ton of both, and I'll get it down the track. Uh, and I believe that's still the truth with these bikes. It is not the case with a slick and a bar bike. They need a little tire slip, and if they have to hit it so hard to get that tire to spin a little bit, their window of spinning or bogging or, or chattering the tire is very narrow. So I, I totally, like I said, I came from Funny Bike. I totally understand what's going on. I don't know the answer. Uh, we'll see what happens over the winter. Let me ask you this, since you know both worlds. This class, knock on wood, has a remarkable safety record. Yeah. These new age Funny Bike builds are running into some trouble. Do you think you have more control with the smaller street tire rather than the big slick? I've ridden them both. The biggest thing is with a rounded tire, we can, our lean to get the bike to change directions is much more effective than a squared slick, especially if they happen to be coming on and off the bar that will always cause a chassis to do different things. Our inputs are uh, on a pro street bike are much better at correcting the direction of the bike than if you've got a big 
the, the wider the tire, the harder, harder it is, and the more square the edges are, the harder it is. So they're, they're really having a tough time. Let's get back to action. Each manufacturer, of course, has their own process. Different chemicals, that's true. Different chemicals, 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 different chemicals,
And so sometimes you'll see him hold, you'll see me hold him there until the track, the tire gets to that point. And then I'll move him forward. The big, biggest thing you'll see me go back and forth is the bike needs to be perfectly straight because uh, I mean, you're talking about a 112 and 113, 60 foot. We've been a 108. Um, it happens so fast. If it's not perfectly straight, he'll be fighting it right, right from the get go. And we're trying to avoid that. What are you saying to him up there? And can he hear you with the bike running? No, very seldom do I talk to him. Almost always hand signs, and it's mostly gestures left or right, and you know, a lot left or a little left. Um, and if I have to talk to him, then there's something unusual going on. Okay. A little sticky there, huh? What do you think, Kent? I think it didn't ship six. All right, the good news is you guys just ripped off a 677, but as you said moments ago, and you looked very concerned, you said it didn't shift sixth. Yeah, and uh, that's when, after that pass, is well, for that pass, that's when we put the sensor on it, and then we found out that we don't have enough air for the five to six or even the fourth to fifth shift is is questionable, but not enough to shift six. So we had to do something for the next day's uh, elimination. Well, Frankie, you are pretty darn good at predicting because you said 670, but you didn't know that it wasn't going to go into sixth gear. Uh, what do you remember about that pass not being able to shift it down there? Uh, I just knew it was a smooth pass right off from the get-go. Uh, I didn't wheelie off the starting line with the uh, shortened wheelbase. Um, so once it got past the eighth mile, I figured it would just be like another clockwork, uh, fifth and the sixth. And then uh, I never shifted in the sixth, so it bounced off the rev limiter and then cost us at least uh, a tenth and maybe a couple mile an hour. What was your speed down there at that point, you know, roughly? Uh, I think it was like 198 because it wouldn't shift in the sixth. What's that feel like when you're going 198 and you're waiting for that shift and it doesn't come? Uh, it's heartbreaking because it was on a good pass <laughs> and then it just went uh, kaput. How would you describe to someone who's never been to a race how much work it can be back in the pit? That really turns into your garage, that canopy, and you spend a lot more time under that thing than you do on the track. Well, thank goodness, Frank, you really has come up to speed because um, my... 15 years of riding, I had Mark Harrell, my crew chief, and he was fantastic. Uh, I could come back from a pass and I would spend my time analyzing the data and trying to figure out how to go faster next round. And Mark would take care of the bike between rounds. And now Frankie's at that level to where I know it's ready to go. And I mainly have to make sure we can go as quick as that track will allow us. It's time for Pro Street once again. Can Frankie do something special? We'll find out. Really good to see this Honda back. Frankie, we were worried you might have heard it last pass. Uh, yeah, we ended up, uh, it was right air due to uh, the six speed auto lever trying out. Uh, wouldn't go in six, so I hit the button, wouldn't go, wouldn't go, so I rolled off and I put two gears into one. So just a learning curve. Well, you were pretty close with your prediction. What's the prediction here? Uh, if it stays down on the ground, I should say uh, high 60, low 70. Love to see it. <laughs> so you got to be really proud of your son, Frankie. Very humble individual, and he's he's pretty good with those predictions as well, isn't he? <laughs> he's pretty spot on with the predictions. I don't know about humble. Um, <laughs> on the internet, he's not so humble, but at the track, it's uh, he's very realistic about what we can do and what we can't. And it's been over a decade now since he's been riding. Is that true? Yeah, I wow. think uh, happened fast. Oh eight, he got on the bike for the first time, and oh nine was his first full season. And how would you assess his development as a rider and how he's improved? Well, it, I think I don't know if I've talked to you about this before. It's an interesting story. I'll try and be quick. Um, his very first time at the track, I wanted him to be on the Pro Street bike the next year, and we were trying to get him on a bike that ran you know, 850s, 820s something. He'd only been on a bone stock bike running 10 O's and uh, we never did find 
an intermediate bike. So we went to the track in October for the Wheelie Fest, which we were invited to. And I was on my Blackbird and he was on the 1000. And within four passes of never being on a bike like that, he went 780s. So he's a really quick learner. He's got a lot of natural gifts. Uh, riding abilities that I had to work on consciously, they just come to him naturally. It's such a science to ride these things too. You and I were talking earlier off camera and not to give away any of your secrets or anything, but you said you were actually using your feet as sensors so that you would know how high the front wheel is. So based on what you were feeling with your feet, you would know whether or not to give it more throttle, let off the throttle. That's amazing. Well, back in the days um, um, before our computer controls, like the ride height sensors and everything else that we have today, um, basically a, a three form, three uh, placements form a triangle or a tripod, and that gives you very accurate information as to how high the front end's coming up. And that's how you have to modulate your clutch and your throttle hand. Truly amazing, and uh, it's amazing how talented Frankie has become. Let's watch him in action again. Uh Cycle drag, yeah. you the man. Give me a pound. You the man. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, cycle drag. Fun for all ages. All right. Let me see the comments. What do you prefer, Honda, Suzuki, and why? If you ever owned a Honda, I want to hear about it. If you ever owned a Suzuki, I want to hear about it. We've got Rudy's Busa and we've got Frankie's Honda. Don't forget, Rudy figured some stuff out earlier this morning. They could fly as well. This is going to be a great drag race. street was easy it wasn't daunting it wasn't harrowing we talked about the legs being willy bars and on that pass are you kidding me what what happened here Ken? well it came up a lot quicker than what we could catch it and uh then frankie had to chop the throttle instead of just rolling and it it really slammed the front end down and crushed the front fender into the the bodywork and and broke it off realistic it really that's what it i mean it broke it off did you guys have extra body work down there or did you have to make do? No, we had to make do. What'd you do, run that one? Well, no, we, we didn't run a fender after that. That was, I believe, the third round of qualifying. And uh, you won't be disqualified for not having a fun fender. It is part of the rules, so that's why we have it. But, uh, I mean, I don't think they're gonna object to us running without a fender. So I take it that one is officially in the Stotts Trophy case. Oh, it's yeah. not going to be repaired. Frank likes to collect all the, like when we've hurt pistons or valves or something, he's got a whole collection of them. I hate to see that stuff, but I'm reminded not to do that again, just like we won't do this again, but uh, he collects this stuff. What a trophy. And as a rider yourself, I mean, how scary of a moment do you think that was for him? You know, I was riding for so long um he's he's had a lot scarier moments and so have i uh actually his time when he came within an inch and a half of the wall at 217 mile an hour that that scared me more than anything and there's mr fearless himself frankie stotts frankie i got to get your souvenir down here my gosh man tell me tell me what that felt like uh this was i think like a third gear power wheelie and uh Rode it out to fourth gear, and as soon as it came down, it uh, sucked up into the uh, bottom of the fairing here, and then got pinched in by the front wheel, uh, front tire, and then got ripped right off the bike. You're fearless, man. You've been on a lot of different motorcycles. For somebody out there who maybe just has street bike experience, dirt bike experience, how would you compare riding this Honda Beast? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 
I mean, I've always ridden turbo bikes, so I really kind of spoiled in that aspect. Um, but I don't know, just the raw power of it is just something special. Was there ever a point where you were a little concerned about what the bike was doing, or did you feel like you had perfect control of everything? No, I felt like I had perfect control of it. Even if it did get out of shape, I still feel I have control of it to a certain degree until it gets a little haywire. As soon as it came off, it was kind of saying, hey, we got no moves. It's always supposed to be sad. Hey, Kent, how would you sum up today's performance? Ours or the class? Yours. Um, new bike blues. Okay. Realistically, I rebuilt this bike over the winter, and this is the first time it's been out. So we went out in the beginning of the year, we won that COTS race on Biff, our old garage bike, and I sold that. So this is the first time the bike's been on the track, and we've made a lot of major changes besides the rules changes. Okay. So I can't complain. I mean, we are qualified number one, uh, even though it didn't shift into six. We went to 677, but uh, that's just new bike blues. What are you working on right now to try to dial in for race day? Uh, we're, we're running out of air for the last... We might be running low on air by the time it shifts from fifth to sixth. Okay. So we're trying to duplicate that here in the pits and see if we can do something a little different to make sure we have plenty of air at the shift. We'll let you get to work. You got a big day tomorrow. Thank you, much. All right, so two questions strike me immediately. Number one, how do you duplicate what it's doing out on the track back in the pits? And number two, what's your mindset there on a Saturday night? You know that you've had some issues and you're excited, you're getting ready for Sunday. I mean, I imagine with a competitive guy like yourself, you could just work all night if you wanted to. When do you draw the line? That used to be the norm. <clears throat> uh, our, our whole thing, when the time that I was riding, was we don't go to sleep until the bike is ready to make the first round the next day. That's how Larry McBride's guys are. Well, unfortunately, Larry and I are the same age. I don't know how the heat can keep doing it because by about one o'clock in the morning, if we're still working, I basically have to pack it in and then start again in the morning. I, I, I'm not the spring chicken anymore. And Frank will work all night, just like I used to, but um, I got old. Well, not only that, you're, you're a very in-shape guy and you got a lot of energy. People got to realize Chicago to Georgia is a long drive. Yep. That'll take a lot out of you. You never get a chance to decompress. You go right into testing. You're up late. You're running around. We're falling on the racetrack. You're burning calories. It's exhausting. Well, Mark and I got to the point one time, uh, we had heard a motor and we were changing motors. And he said to me, he goes, Kenny goes, I, I, I got to get some sleep. I'm like, Mark, we have to have this. We have to fire it up. We have to make sure it's running and everything. He goes, Kent, I can't see straight anymore. I'm so tired. I'm like, and I didn't understand it. And then I was about three years later, I got to that point. And then I understood it. Mm -hmm. And now you have to do whatever your body will let you. Well, that's where, like I said, if people were watching this who don't know the inside ball game of drag racing, how sleepless it can be and just how much work it is. I'm with you guys. I'm a young man. And that happened to me down in the Orlando grudge race that after three days of three in the morning, finally... Energizer Bunny ran out, and I'm yeah. like, whoa, do I need to sleep in my car? Yeah, and the grudge guys, nothing comes alive until 10 o'clock at night. And when you're getting up at 6 in the morning, three days in a row, and you're running until 3, that's, that's pretty crazy. Anyhow, back to what you were saying about right now, you're trying to get the bike to shift into 6th. How are you testing that back in the pits? Well, we can duplicate the shifts and the boost controller in the, in the pits with the bike off. So it uses the same amount of air over six and a half seconds and then, re then record how much air is left. So we're able, we're able to dupl duplicate that without running the bike. We can have a system in the computer that allow us to do that and then actually have real parameters that we know, okay, we need more air. Well, let's get to Sunday race day, see how it goes.
What an upset. That's drag racing, guys. 736 gets it done. What the heck happened? Very sorry, Kent. What the heck happened? I have no idea. Very sorry, guys. Well, it had, you know, happened. That's drag really racing. Really crazy weekend. We'll see you guys back next year. Very sorry. So this is a tough one. I, I can't remember the last time I saw Frankie lose first round, but that speaks to the incredible challenging nature of drag racing. What happened there, Kent? Um, like so many times you hear, it was a $5 part. It was the clutch switch that uh, was being intermittent. So the two-step that normally limits us to about 7,200 RPM, it was coming off that and trying to, to jump through the light, but we stayed with the front brake on, so it didn't red light. But as soon as Frank did let the clutch go, it just annihilated the tire. Tough break there, but on to happier things, guys. We're not done yet, because guess what? We're going to bring you some top secret bonus testing runs. We were bright and early. Let's check out some test runs. There it is, guys. World's quickest and fastest on the street bike. We'll see what they can do. Early on, they're ready to go. Goodness, you're okay. The glue caught you too. And what I got to admire about you, about how tough and resilient you are, you get right up and start measuring the tire again. You were unfazed. You shook it right off. Well, what used to happen is we'd come out of our shoes and then you're walking around and your socks are leaving uh, print and, and actually screwing up the track. So now I tie it so tight I can't come out of them. But in the same token, when it's stuck to the track, you're going to fall over. <laughs> There's a lot of VHT down on this racetrack. We've already had one fall, one shoe that got stuck. Be careful up there on the line, but that's a good sign for track. So Frankie drifts towards the wall a little bit. He gets out of it. At this point in testing, what are you looking for? What do you want to see? Well, we struggled all weekend with the shifting, and I, I knew uh, right away on the four to five shift it didn't make it, so that's why it only went 750. He was, he was slowing down uh, probably before the eighth mile. Wow, when you go back and you dissect the data, what, what is the most important factors when you look at a pass like that? Well, number one, you hope you didn't hurt anything. Yeah, for <laughs> because sure. Because when it doesn't shift, it, it can cause a lot of problems. Luckily, we didn't have any issues with the transmission in, in that sense, uh, but um, you, you're, like I said, new bike blues. Um, the biggest thing is if I could have, uh, and I should have, uh, being a national event, brought the old CO2 system along with me, it would have been put on in a heartbeat. And Valdosta, they were running them pretty quick in this test session. How long does it take you guys to turn around the bike? A minimum of 45 minutes if all it is is a standard cool down and, and turn around. All right, let's see how it goes here. <laughs> So that looked like a very clean test pass, nice and straight. Frankie gets out of it at some point. Probably would have been a nice six second run if you would have been in that it the was, whole way. Right? That was a planned shutoff with still shifting the bike. In other words, we didn't, if it wasn't gonna shift, we didn't wanna be under full power and not have it shift. So that was a planned shutoff. Uh, we found out later it did not shift. Very impressive. Well guys, what do you think? Let me know down below in the comments. Do you love this? And if you did not watch part one, our full garage tour, make sure you watch it. We had a lot of fun talking to Frank and Kent. Kent, if, if you could, if somebody watched this far and they don't know the stats on the spike, could you give me the quick stats? Horsepower, wheelbase, what are we dealing with? Uh, horsepower is right about 545. We haven't had it on a dyno in a long time, but to go 218, you need at least that at our weight. 
Uh, our best 60 foot is 108. Our best eighth mile is, is uh, 421 uh, and 646 at 218. And what is the cost of a pro street bike? If you could, I mean, I know that's a tough one because money is well, you, power. You have your unlimited budgets, um, that which is not ours. Um, uh, I think the cheapest you could build a top five pro street bike for would be $75,000. Okay. That would be the lowest end of what it takes to build one of these. And finally, it's been a really crazy era here for everybody, for the world with the pandemic, especially yeah. motorsports. What's, what's next for your team? What's this mean for your team? We're still not sure. You know, obviously when the pandemic hit in March, we were all like, okay, let's get this thing over with, get, you know, the nation healthy again and get back to work and, and, and all the things we want to do. And we're still not there. So I'm not sure. Um, and even my sponsors are asking me what, what our plans are for next year. The schedule is out. The race schedule is out. Um, and we plan on making all of the NHGRO races and the, uh, the $10,000 Battle Royale and the World Finals. But we'll have to see on a couple of things. One, Frank still has, you know, has to work Saturdays for most of the time. We're working on that and we don't know what the pandemic's going to do. And that's a great point. You know, we're so used to racing and full-time professional yeah. racers. I can speak to this. There's a whole lot of vacation days for the average man. Yep. And I've been in that boat. I told you last time. I've lost jobs because of drag racing. <laughs> it's it's probably very tough to, to get Frankie cleared for a whole schedule that you want to run. It is. And they'll do it as long as we can commit to a schedule. But we just haven't been able to commit to where we want to go. We know that the year that we spent going to all the XDA races on the East Coast, we would leave Wednesday night and get back Tuesday morning. It's a whole week. That's almost. just not possible again. That cost so much time and money. We enjoyed it, had a great time, um, but we are probably going to race the NHDRO series, and that's more, you know, nothing more than six, seven hours uh, besides the Battle Royale and the World Finals. Excellent. Well, wish you guys all the best. We love watching this Honda, this red rocket out here. You guys are never allowed to retire. <laughs> I'm just going to lay that out there right now. Well, that's but, up to Frank. I can keep building motors forever. That's, that's enjoyable. And tuning them is enjoyable. Chasing the money and, and keeping sponsors happy so that we can continue to race. The, that's a lot of work. And people don't realize it. Uh, a long time ago, a uh, uh, I forget his name. He asked me, he goes, why don't I teach a course in, in uh, how to get sponsors? Because I'm one of the lucky pre people that have had a lot of help in my career. Um, but I, honestly, I think most of the class isn't willing to put in the time that it takes to get the sponsor and then keep them, keep them happy and keep them informed. It, it's just, it. I would say for every hour I put in on the bike, I put at least a half hour in uh, on keeping sponsors happy. So if you're putting 30 hours a week into the bike, you're putting another 15 hours in a week to the sponsors. And rightfully so, but most people aren't willing to do that. Well, you always have been, and that's why you're one of the best, one of the greats, and you have such an awesome program. We wish you all the best moving forward, that's for sure. And we can't wait to see this machine go down the racetrack again. Thank you much. So Frank, we know that the rules change constantly in this class, uh, changing over the off season. You guys are going to be shorter and heavier. Yes, sir. So tell me about what that's like from your standpoint, what you plan on doing to this bike. Uh, I mean, from our standpoint, it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge only because we've been allowed uh, a long wheelbase for the past couple of years. Um, the whole sea height issue, that's not our big, big deal. Cause when we went to 46 was when we had, the three inch or 22 inch seat height. 
Um, so I don't think that would be a big issue. Uh, I think the wheelbase going back to 68 and a half inches for us and then adding the uh, 35 pounds is what's going to be uh, uh, detrimental to the 1000s. Always got to roll with those punches, that's for sure, huh? Yep, always. Well, if anybody can do it, you guys can. We'll give it a shot. Well, guys, again, I want to thank the Honda legends. I've told them they can never retire. They got to be out there forever. Did you enjoy this tour? Did you enjoy this Peyton Manning-esque film <laughs> breakdown by the great Ken Stotts? We appreciate that. We appreciate Frankie. Hope you enjoyed it. Any final thoughts here, guys? No, just hopefully everybody has a, a better 2021 and healthy new year. And uh, ride red. Amen, guys. Keep an eye on it. If you like that video, here's another one for you. We're on the quest to bring you the most impressive motorcycles we can find, even if that's in Schaumburg, Illinois, the world's quickest and fastest Honda. You know if there's anything fast motorcycles, we're in. Cycle drag rolls on. Frankie, I heard reports that you said you could whoop Jeremy Teasley. Is there any truth to that? I mean, there's a whole bunch of truth to that. It's been uh, proven and verified. <laughs> oh, I like it. Very confident. Watch out, Jeremy Teasley. The Honda's coming for you.